That's good stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Brother Ron Bailey, would you come up here, please? Uh, while Ron's coming up here, I want to read you a, a poem that Clyde Box wrote about the 9-11 situation. This is a cry throughout the entire plain when men and women said in fear, not knowing what the future held, perhaps cruel death was very near. They called their loved ones on the plain. They told them of their plot, plight. Terrorists had taken over the plain. This well could be their final flight. They proclaimed their love to their wives. They knew what lay ahead. What they did could save some lives, but their deed could leave them dead. Without hesitation and without regret, knowing their action would take its toll, one of the brave ones rose to his feet and shouted to the others, let's roll. That's America. It's our joy to have Dr. Ron Beatty from Winston-Salem Marine Baptist Church. Ron has got a heartbeat for America. He's a president of Return America, doing a great job with that. I'm glad he's my friend. I'm glad he's a neighbor and friend to our town and our city because he's a true man of God and loves, uh, loves America. And he loves, uh, got on his uniform every day. I'll have to act right now, won't I? Amen. <laughs> Come on up here, Doc. Just give him a hand. Good to have him here, amen. Thank you, All right. He said, talk just a minute, so I'm talking, all right? <laughs> I love to talk, <laughs> amen. I could tell some funny stories about my brothers over there. <laughs> yeah. We got one of them sitting over there as lazy. I won't say which one it is. When I was a boy, I had to, anything around, I had to do the mowing, I had to do the cleaning, the cooking, and he courted. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, my brother did save my hide one time. So you wired up? No, I got another story. All right. You know how it is when you court, you, you, you're in the 11th grade. I remember at senior high school. I can tell you, is my wife in here? I ain't gonna say much about this. But anyway, we've been married 44 years. I think I can hang on with it. But as a little girl, you know, when you, get, you, get, you work hard to get a class ring, as soon as you get it, some girl gets it. It's crazy, ain't it? You know, they got two tons of wax. If they put it on their finger and then it's around their neck, it looks like a cowbell. <laughs> And this little girl, she fell in love with me, so I gave her my ring, amen? I went, love is just all it was, but guess what? She dumped me <laughs> for another guy. Can you imagine that? <laughs> so I got my brother, I didn't even have my driving license. I said, John, go with me. He said, where are we going? I got something, I got somebody I want to whip. <laughs> he said, what? I'm gonna say, I'm gonna beat the snot out of him. Take me over. I said, if he gets her, he's going to get her with a fat lip. I said, I'm going to do something to it. And I was, I was upset. Now, back in them days, I had a temper. My brothers know that. Still got it. <laughs> no, I don't. But uh, I had a real bad temper. But my brother Johnny did me a favor. We got in the car and was going over. And he said, where are you going? I told him. I said, I'm going to whip a guy. He said, oh, if she likes you, she'd stay with you. He turned the car around. So I whipped him. <laughs> 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 no, I didn't. He did me a favor because he said, no dice. And he turned me around and took me back home. He saved my hide because I told him this. I, and it's true. I said, now, if he's whipping me, get him off from me. But I said, if I'm whipping him, leave me alone. <laughs> brains, folks, brains. <laughs> You cops think you got backups. I got backups. Amen. Where are you, you ready now? I don't know why I thought of that. Is this yours or mine? That's mine. Okay. All right. Get with it. Several years ago, 
from the state of Minnesota. A man was sworn into Congress. A lot of controversy surrounded his swearing-in ceremony because Mr. Keith Edelman was a Muslim. It was stated in the news media that he would be the first Muslim to be sworn into the United States Congress. So they decided to make a big issue out of it. And they went into the building of the archives in Washington, D.C. And they got a copy of a Koran that Thomas Jefferson owned. And so they had a big swearing in ceremony. Nancy Pelosi was there and she placed her hand on the Koran. Mr. Edelman placed his hand on the Koran. And something that our forefathers would never have allowed. The representative from Minnesota was sworn into a congressional office with his hand on a copy of the Koran. The people speculated, well, he's the first Muslim to be sworn into Congress. This is a big deal. However, the truth is, he was not the first Muslim to be sworn into Congress. In 1799, another man who was a Muslim was sworn in to the United States Congress. He served from about 1799 until about 1832, 33, 34 in that era. This man went into Congress in 1799, a Muslim. He came out in the 1830s, a Christian. Amen. The reason he came out a Christian, he came under the influence of Francis Scott Key. And Francis Scott Key won him to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. So they raised the question, they said, well, since Mr. Thomas Jefferson owned the Koran, Mr. Edelman was sworn in on, then evidently Mr. Jefferson must have been a supporter of Islam. Or else he would not have owned a copy of the Koran. So as we do a little research, we understand why Mr. Jefferson owned a copy of the Koran. When Mr. Jefferson became the president of the United States, Approximately 15 to 20 percent of our national budget, notice I said our national budget, was being paid to Islamic countries. The reason we were paying 15 to 20 percent of our national budget to Islamic countries was because they were hijacking our ships at sea. When we had broken with England, England at one time gave military support to our shipping industry, but now they had long since forgotten us, and so our ships had no protection at sea. The Islamic countries recognized that, so they hijacked our ships at sea, and the only way we could get our ships and our people back was to pay ransom. So when Mr. Jefferson became president with our national budget paying 15 to 20 percent of their income to Islamic countries, Mr. Jefferson said, we have one of three options. Number one, we either keep our ships out of international waters. Number two, we continue to pay ransom. Or number three, in so many words, we clean house. He said, I believe we're a clean house. Although we did not have an established fighting force, we put together one. And we went after those Islamic countries holding us hostage. 
And the war lasted for several years. But several of the countries, Islamic countries, almost immediately surrendered. But there was another country that we had to fight for an extended period of time. But we won. And we brought 20% of our national income home to America. When you hear the theme song of the Marines, you hear them talk about from the shores of Tripoli. That was the last Islamic country to fall that had held us hostage. But we said enough is enough. And so we went after those countries which had held us hostage to free our men at sea and to keep them from confiscating our shipping industry. And so as a result of that, we brought 20% of our national income home. That's the reason Mr. Jefferson owned a copy of the Koran. Mr. Jefferson said, if I'm going to fight my enemy, I want to know something about the techniques, the thinking of my enemy. So Mr. Jefferson bought a copy of the Koran to figure out what makes the enemy tick. Therefore, when Mr. Edelman was sworn into Congress, it was, he was not sworn in on a copy of the Koran because Mr. Jefferson believed in Islam. Uh, they failed to understand that he owned the Koran because he wanted to know something about the manipulation of his enemy. Our nation was not founded on the Koran. Right. Our nation was founded upon the precepts of the Word of God. As a matter of fact, Congress allocated money to, to, de, to determine what was it that made our forefathers tick. And so they allocated money to find out from the year 1765 until 1805, they wanted to determine the, in the decision-making process of, of uh, our forefathers, where did they get their reasoning ability? And so from 1765 until 1805, a committee poured through 15,000 documents of our forefathers. And they came to this consideration. That when our forefathers spoke, that they made their decisions directly from the scriptures 34% of the time, and that they were influenced by the scriptures 94% of the time. The Bible was important to our forefather. Not the Koran, but the Bible. When George Washington was sworn in as president, he added a phrase that our presidents down through the years have continued to use. He said, so help me God. He was not talking about Allah. He was talking about the Judeo-Christian God. Because America was founded upon Judeo-Christianity. And he said, so help me God. And he had a copy of the Bible in front of him upon which he had placed his hand in the book of Deuteronomy where God had promised, if you obey my commandments, I will bless you. If you disobey my commandments, I will curse you. And when Washington took his oath of office, then he took the Bible, put it up to his lips, and kissed it because the Bible was important to him. And then he took his cabinet and several members of Congress down the street, about two or three blocks, and they had a two-hour prayer meeting. That's where we came from. If you go up into the Washington Monument, you will find scriptures inscribed. All over the Washington Monument, our, our forefathers recognized Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. If you pull out the cornerstone of the Washington Monument, you'll find three of the greatest documents to ever come across the stage of human history. You'll find a copy of the Declaration of Independence, a copy of the United States Constitution, and you'll find a Bible in the cornerstone of the Washington Monument. If you go in the Jefferson Memorial and the Lincoln Memorial and all through Washington, D.C., you'll find quotes from the Scripture. This nation has been successful for these 200 plus years 
because we took in consideration at our very beginning, if we survived as a nation, we must know which book to trust, which book to read, which book to follow. And so we took in consideration there's only one book, and that's the book, the Bible, the Word of God, divinely inspired, forever settled in heaven, and that if our nation is great and remains great, we must follow the precepts of that Bible. And we've done that for these many years, and God has greatly blessed us. We need to return this evening back to the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me.